السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his companions his household may Allah bless them all and bless every one of us and grant us goodness in this world and the next. My brothers and sisters, I commence immediately where we left off yesterday. We had made mention of the magicians who had come in order to compete with Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him. And we made mention of how the sticks and ropes that they had come with were looking like they were serpents moving. And when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam declared the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let his stick down, it became a snake that actually ate up everything that was there. And immediately these magicians who were masters in magic realized that what he has is different from what we have. We are masters, we know. But this particular person is no magician. So they immediately fell prostrate and they declared their belief in the Lord of Moses of Musa alayhi salam. Now this is extremely interesting. As an introduction, I wish to make mention of one or two points. Sometimes when we have something for a very long time, we take it for granted. And when others have it, after ha not having had it, they sometimes appreciate it more than we do. The same applies to materialistic things. You might have a motor vehicle, the latest car, and you've been driving it for six months, one year. You know, for you, it becomes a car that is, okay, it's my vehicle, no big deal. If someone were to drive it for a short period of time, they would appreciate it so much. To them, it's something so big. I remember when we were young, my father had bought a vehicle that was very old, but we used to call it my father's new car. You know, the new doesn't mean new as in the car is new. But for us, it was very new. Subhanallah. We used to appreciate it. Make sure there's no scratch on it. Make sure everything's okay. Subhanallah. I want to let you know that sometimes we who were born Muslim take Islam for granted. And sometimes those who have reverted to Islam become far stronger than all of us. They take the religion more seriously because they have seen the darkness. They appreciate what it was like back in the day when they did not have the deen. And now that they've come in, they have the opportunity to plug in with their maker. They have the opportunity to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who made you, the one who nourishes, sustains, protects, and you seek forgiveness to him and you have a relationship with him and you pray so many times you are clean you are disciplined you are happy you are healthy because of your diet and so on they take it seriously may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who appreciate what we have now i want to tell you what happened these magicians fell prostrate when they fell prostrate the pharaoh Immediately, he realized that I've lost big time. I paid these guys to come to help me, to come and prove a point against this man and look at them. So he says, Have you believed in him before I allowed you to do that? Now, just a few moments before that, he was saying, I am your God. If you worship anyone besides me, I'm going to punish you. Now he's saying, I still didn't permit you to worship someone else. It means he's acknowledging he's not a God. Because he's saying, I have not permitted you. Are you doing it? And I have not yet permitted you. The term yet here means that, you know what? If I allowed you, you could have done it. It means you're not the God, subhanAllah. Because a God never speaks like this. So look at how sometimes when a person creates a fabrication around him and he thinks he's bigger than he actually is, he shoots himself in the foot. Why? Because his statements become contradictory for those who understand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So now he's saying, you believing in him before I've allowed you. But it was too late. They were so strong in their faith. In one moment, they became so strong that nothing could deter them. Nothing could shake them. With us, born Muslimin, 
Something happens somewhere in the world that we don't agree with at all. As a result, there's a little bit of pressure on the Muslims. So you change your name from Muhammad to Mo because I, I can't handle it. And what happens is you remove everything that makes you Islamic. And then uh, sometimes the hijab is gone, everything else is gone, and you want to walk in a way that you are not even recognized as a Muslim solely because someone very, very far away did something that Islam does not even condone. Take a look at the bombings and the killings and whatever is happening across the globe. We don't condone it. We don't agree with it at all. We are not allowed to harm innocent lives, innocent human beings at all, no matter where it is. We, are, we promote peace. Those who don't, they don't do it in our name. They do it with their own warped ideologies and understandings. But it's not in my name or yours. So it does not mean we must give up our faith. In fact, all the more reason we should be conspicuous Muslims and do good. So people know these are lovely people. If I know one guy who has a Muslim name who did bad, I know another 10,000 who have Muslim names who do really good. That's how it should be. But we go into a shell. You know, we become people who hide our Islam. You got a beautiful name, Abdul Jabbar. What's your name? Jabber. Where did the Jabber come from? Do you jab people? Astaghfirullah. That is the name of Allah. Don't spoil it. Al Jabbar. What a beautiful name. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. So the point being raised, they fell prostrate. Here is the Pharaoh telling them, I didn't allow you to do this because obviously he now did not know how to show face. He didn't know what to tell his cronies and Musa alayhi salam is standing there and these people have fallen prostrate and the Pharaoh is feeling like a small fool, subhanallah, and he doesn't know what to say, what to do. He says, hey, I didn't allow you yet. How can you do that before I allowed you? If we lose, we would have lost together. Not you guys decide on your own that right, we've lost. Basically, that's what he was trying to say. So that didn't work. It did not deter them. So he tried something else. He now went, verse number 49 of Surah Al-Shu'ara, which is the 26th Surah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Pharaoh then threatened them. He did that in the past. He did it to Musa alayhi salam. What was the threat? I'm going to do two things to you. I'm going to cut off your hands and your legs crossed. Crossed meaning the right hand and the left leg so that you can do nothing, nothing at all. You see, once you cross it and you have severed both of those organs crossed, then you leave a person totally destroyed. If they're not crossed, at least they can do something. But if they're crossed, they're totally gone. So he says, I'm going to do this for you. And thereafter, do you know what he says? He says, and I'm going to crucify all of you in public. I'm going to crucify you. Now imagine they just prostrated for Allah. They just became Muslim. Muslim means those who submitted to Allah and the Rasul of the time. That's a Muslim. Anyone who believes in Allah alone and who worshiped the Rasul or who worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeyed the Rasul of the time was a Muslim. So they became Muslim. How many minutes ago? How many minutes before this? Moments before. They got one threat. They got another threat. And guess what they said? Verse number 50. Allah says, they responded to this man. The man whom a few moments before that they were asking him, if you recall what we said yesterday, hey, if we win here, are you going to make us, uh, you know, you're going to give us some money or what's going to happen here if we win? They were not no more worried about money. Why? Because for those who believe, yes, you are concerned about your livelihood. You are concerned about living, but your faith in the Almighty comes first. I will earn, but I'm not going to compromise my relationship with Allah because of a dollar or a rand or a pound. No. First is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he has said this is wrong, it's wrong. After that, I'll try my best to earn. <clears throat> so these people immediately, they just said to the Pharaoh and Allah makes mention of this. No problem, no hassle. It's okay. It's fine. Do what you want. Why? We are all going to return to our Lord one day. You, in another place, Allah says that these people told him, 
فقض ما أنت قاض إنما تقضي هذه الحياة الدنيا rule and judge against us whatever you want do what you want with us you will only be able to do these things on this earth once we get to the hereafter it's no longer anything to do with you or your power or your might nothing do what you want imagine they didn't give up their faith that conviction was such my brothers and sisters two things we need to learn one is they were in the presence of a nabi of allah right two is they had a sincere heart they were genuine if you are genuine, you will benefit from revelation. And when that happens, the conviction levels are so high that nobody can convince you otherwise. Look at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Some of the companions, like Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhum, he came out in order to harm Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Within a few moments, he became known as radiallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. And he became known as one of the most powerful of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So much so that today, if we were to make mention of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, only the hypocrites will feel that that wasn't a good man. But everyone else knows that Umar ibn al-Khattab, if he were to walk down a gully, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Shaytan always walked down another gully. He didn't even want to come to, he didn't even want to cross paths with him. To this day, it's only shayateen who dislike Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to defend the honor of the greatest to tread the earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So immediately he became known as radiallahu anhu. The past is wiped out. It's gone. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. He started a new leaf. The same applies to every one of us. Lesson we draw. Let's save ourselves. If you have a past, that is exactly what it is. P-A-S-T. Past. It's gone. It's over. It is not today. Change yourself. Now you will earn the pleasure of Allah. Quit your bad ways and habits. No matter what it is, you know the bad habits of today. There are so many. The people are involved in them. Even if the whole world is doing it, if it is bad, I promise you quit it for the sake of Allah. Your past will be just that. You will start a new relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will be similar to that of these people. These Magicians who now became Muslimin, you know what Allah says for them? Subhanallah. I want to ask you a question. They were penalized after that. Whatever happened to them happened after that. They did not give up their faith. They lost their lives as a result of all this. You know what Allah says? We forgave them. We granted them highest ranks in paradise. I want to ask you a question. How many times did they prostrate for Allah? How many? One. One. They made one prostration for Allah. And Allah says, we wiped out whatever happened for them was Jannatul Firdaus. How many times do we prostrate for Allah? We don't even know. In each salah this evening, you would have to sit and count, right? Brothers and sisters, don't you agree with me? If even one of those is genuine and sincere, your entire past can be wiped out in the, in the same way. It's the same Allah we're talking about, right? Your conviction, don't give up your salah. Sometimes we are ashamed of reading our salah because, you know, we're in an environment where maybe, you know, these people might look at me and say, look at this person. No, do it with honor, with dignity. That is your salah. So what if they were to laugh at you for a little while? That is your jannah. These people were threatened. They were harmed. What he promised to do to them, according to some narrations, was done to them. They didn't give up. La dair. We are not worried. There's nothing going to harm us. No harm. But you're not going to be able to do anything to us. You can only do something in this world. As it is, we have to die. Whether at your hands or whether later on, we have to die. Subhanallah. Look at how they looked at it. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. What a powerful lesson to learn from these magicians. And like I say, a small act of worship, but it was genuine. It was sincere. And you know, my brothers and sisters, there are so many ahadith that prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks for an excuse to give you Jannah. Sometime in your life when it was very difficult to do something for the sake of Allah and you did it. You did it. How many times do we see of a hadith? I give you some examples. One hadith, a lady quenched the thirst of, or a lady was kind to a cat, so she achieved forgiveness. A man quenched the thirst of a dog, so he achieved forgiveness. What are these deeds? One of deeds. It doesn't mean that they were not decent people and so on. They must have been reasonable or they must have had a good heart. But Allah loved one specific deed 
And he said, for you is Jannah. This was, this was a lot. What about us? I'm sure sometimes there's something really difficult and you know what Allah wants from you and you say, oh Allah, you know what? For you, I'm going to do this. That could just be your Jannah. I sometimes give an example of a scarf. It's not easy to put on hijab. But if you say, oh Allah, I'm going to endure just for you. Allah might decide to overlook everything else and say that was your sacrifice. It's possible. It is possible. But because we don't know which deed it is, we've got to keep on trying. So fulfill as best as you can, whatever you can. Keep on seeking the forgiveness of Allah to save yourself. One of the most powerful ways of saving ourselves from calamity in this world and the next is to ask Allah's forgiveness every day. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu used to seek forgiveness up to 100 times a day when he did not even need it. We need it. But we don't even seek forgiveness of Allah. The whole month of Ramadan passed. Oh, hey, I forgot to seek forgiveness, man. You know, when someone is reading, Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik, or Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibbu al afwa fa'afu anna, some of these supplications seeking forgiveness and steadfastness, sometimes we just pay lip service. Think about it for a moment. What am I saying? Oh Allah, forgive me. I quit my bad ways. My brothers and sisters, I invite you and myself to commence a beautiful new relationship with Allah and with His Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Have a nice relationship. And inshallah, you will see the mercy descend in your life in every single way. Slowly but surely, the doors will begin to open. You will be a happier person, a healthier person, an asset to your family, your community, and the ummah at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. So after that, the story continued. And there is another point that I'd like to make mention of before we continue to the next story. In this story, it ends where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs Musa alayhi salam, the prophet Moses, to take his people and to go in a certain direction, the direction of the sea. They began to march in that direction and the Pharaoh heard that these people are running away. Now, you know, sometimes when someone has now run away, sometimes just leave him, you know. But he decides, no, I'm going to follow them. I'm going. Why? Because that destruction of the Pharaoh was in his own planning. He's the one who chose to go. Had he not chosen to go, probably he wouldn't have been destroyed, but it was already predestined. He had to do that. So he decided, you know what, I'm going to follow. He followed and he did not follow alone. He told his people today, we're going to crush these guys. We're going to destroy them. Let's all go to witness this. So he took the main mala, mala meaning the main chiefs and the main comrades and his cronies, so to speak. And they all went with a huge army and they decided to get to the sea. Now at the sea, there was a problem. What was the problem? Musa alayhi salam is there with his people. The sea is in front of them and behind them is the Pharaoh with the army. So his people, you know, they always were, and this is after many years of oppression. They were always skeptical. You know, they always felt that we're being punished and we're being hurt and harmed. And why is it? My brothers and sisters, it happens to us. I explained it the other day. When you are inside, you will be tested. When you are outside, your tests are not that bad. What does that mean? When you enter the school, that's when you qualify to write the exam. But if you did not enroll in the school, you won't get the exams. When you enter the fold of Islam, Allah says, okay, you believe. Okay, believe. I want to test that belief. Come here. I'm going to take your money away. Do you still believe? Yes, I do. I'm going to take your health away. Do you still believe? Yes, I do. I'm going to take your child away. Do you still believe? Yes, I do. You're a true believer. Paradise is yours. We tested you. Go. What about the one who didn't believe in the first place? Enjoy your life. You don't have a paradise anyway. You see? So when you enter the fold, expect to be tested. It's in the Quran, Surah Al-Ankabut. We've read this verse so many times. Do people think that it's sufficient for them to say we are believers and then they won't be tested? Allah says we tested all those who said they were believers to find out who was truthful and who was lying. Now you know why we have greater difficulty than anyone else because we are in the exam room. So you are going to be tested. So the same applies. These people were followers of Musa alayhi salam. Are you sure? Okay. You're going to listen to what the Nabi tells you. Yes. Okay. Come, let's go. We're marching. Where are we marching? To the sea. Let's go to the sea. Who's behind us? The Pharaoh. What's going to happen now? What did they say? The companions of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, they said, you know what? Now 
Now we have been caught up. Now we have been caught up. Meaning they began to lose hope that we're going to be crushed. Something has to happen. Behind us is a problem. In front of us is a big sea. What to do? Musa alayhi salam, that man who knew that when he was threatened by the Pharaoh, he was calm. When the magicians came, he was calm. When the snakes and all that were looking and appearing as though they were from the ropes of those magicians, he was calm. He knew he was calm. When he was in this position, he was still calm. What's going to happen? Allah said he's with me. There's no way I can lose. It's impossible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta 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 told him to strike the water with his stick. The same stick, subhanallah. The same stick. Strike. When it struck, subhanallah, the water began to create huge highways going down into the bed of the sea. And they were looking like a miracle. Immediately they started going in. Subhanallah. You know, they were marching in 12 different rows, armies. And they went in, subhanallah. And as they went in, the Pharaoh comes and he notices. He says, now he's too arrogant. He's too proud to admit that this was not me. He says, yes, I instructed the sea to open. It's open for us. It has opened for you, but not to save you, to destroy you. He doesn't know. So what happened? This arrogance, this haughtiness, he still did not turn to Allah. Still. And the punishment was coming. How many of us, we see difficulty upon difficulty. We get further away from Allah. We don't come back to Allah. And Allah says, look, I gave you the difficulty so that you come to me. A person never read Salah. Allah made them sick. He still didn't read Salah. Allah gave them a terminal illness until he said, hey, oh Allah. Allah says, okay, that's all I needed. I loved you enough. I wanted you to die in a condition where you came to me. You came a little bit closer to me. That is why sometimes we are tested in order to get closer to Allah. Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtala. When Allah loves you, he tests you so that you can soften up. You come. How many times we have big, big problems. We come for salah. When there's no problem, there's no salah. Allahu Akbar. It happens sometimes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this man says, Let's go in. And they started marching and they went in with all their men. And still Musa alayhi salam and his people were now at the other side going up. And when this man was in the center, the water started closing in on him. When it started closing in on him, still he was not convinced, still not convinced. And when he began to drown and when his people were drowning and everyone was being destroyed, then he, when he saw the angel of death, what did he do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta idha adrakahu al-gharaq. When the drowning got to him, the point where his soul began to come out of his own body, and he was the one who used to say, I was a God. Allah says that he said, Amantu annahu la ilaha illa alladhi amanat bihi banu Israel wa ana min al-muslimin. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship. Besides the God of Banu Israel. And I'm a Muslim. Why did he have to say besides the God of Banu Israel? Why couldn't he just say besides Allah? Because he used to say, I am Allah. So if he were to say no God worthy of worship besides Allah, some people might think he's referring to himself. So he had to make it clear that I'm referring to the God of Banu Israel. Finally, he had to get to it. But Allah says too late. My brothers and sisters, the door of repentance is wide open up to the point where your soul starts departing your body and you get to a point known as gharghara. Inna Allah ta'ala yaqbilu tawbat al-abdi ma lam yugharghir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the tawbah and the repentance of anyone for as long as their soul has not got to the point of gharghara departing the body. So in this stage, in this case, it was already too late. Allah says, is it now that you want to believe and you were transgressing all along and you were from amongst the corrupt ones now there was one more problem the people would never believe that the pharaoh is dead motionless if he remained in that ocean or in the sea and the fish ate him or whatever else he decomposed and so on people would not believe that this man so powerful who's killed so many people who called himself a god whom people used to worship he's no more so what did allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do allah says 
فاليوم ننجيك ببدنك لتكون لمن خلفك آية. On this day, we are going to spit that body of yours out, preserve it so that it can be a lesson for those who are going to follow after you. And a man who used to call himself a god, look at him, look at him. If anyone's been to see the mummies in Egypt, any one of them, the ugliest, the most rotten, the most people wouldn't even like to look there twice. Subhanallah. That's the guy, one of them, one of them, whichever one of them, maybe Ramses the second, according to some studies, maybe not. But when any one of them used to say, I'm the God, and he has slaughtered millions and billions, meaning so many people, and he has perpetrated heinous crimes on earth. Look where he is. So Allah is saying, hey, you people are not even a fractional of power of his. You don't even have a fraction of that power, nor his wealth. You don't even have a fraction of it. So don't become haughty. Look at how he ended. Save yourselves. Save yourselves. Let your ending be such that you will arrive in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a smile. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a good death. Amen. So these are the lessons we learn from this Pharaoh. How to save ourselves from that story. You see, protect yourself from haughtiness. When the signs come to you, take heed. When, when difficulties and tests come, have faith in Allah. Look at Musa alayhi salam. He says, Kalla inna ma'iyya rabbi sayahdeen. When his people told him, we are now caught. The sea is in front and the Pharaoh at the back. He says, we are never caught. Allah is with me. He will guide me. And he was indeed guided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this. And at the end, Allah says to us all, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةٌ وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ These are repeated so many times in Surah Al-Shu'ara after the end of the stories of all of the prophets of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةٌ Indeed, in that there are lessons. There are lessons. Lessons for whom? For those with intellect. In this story we've just mentioned, there are signs. There are signs for those who want to take heed. And Allah says, another sign is, وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ A lot of them were not believers. The majority of those were not believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to draw our attention to something. The majority is not always right. People could be doing wrong. If the whole world is doing wrong, what's right will remain right. Even if the entire globe decides, you know what, it's wrong. And what is wrong will remain wrong, even if the whole world begins to perpetrate it. So this goes to show, you follow what is right. Not necessarily the majority will follow it. You follow what's right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast and may he guide us. And that's why at the end, Allah says, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ These are two qualities of Allah that are, subhanallah, on two different ends. Al-Izzah is talking about the power of Allah. Allah is very powerful. And Ar-Rahma is the mercy. Why does Allah connect between the two qualities, the power and the mercy? He does so in order to show us that He forgives having the ability to punish. He still forgives. That's the height of mercy. You know, if you are merciful upon someone because you have to be, you can't really do anything about it. You have to sit with them because you cannot do anything about it. Yeah, it's okay. It's mercy, but it could be contaminated with a bit of fear. In the case of Allah, there's no fear. Not at all. Meaning Allah doesn't fear anyone. Allah is the one, the most powerful. He can crush. He can do what he wants. But he says, Ar-Rahim, I'm still the most merciful. And Ar-Rahim is a special mercy for the believers. So Allah says, you know what? As much as you know that I can punish you, I want to tell you that my mercy goes beyond that. My mercy supersedes that anger of mine. وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah says, my mercy has encompassed absolutely everything. Therefore, I repeat again, my brothers and sisters, never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment we lose hope, we cannot be saved from the wrath of Allah because we have done something against the instruction of Allah. Allah told us not to lose hope. We're losing hope. If that's the case, you are insulting Allah. You are insulting the quality of mercy. We know he is powerful. We know he has prepared a punishment, but we also know that we are trying. Aren't we trying? Keep trying and you will achieve the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep doing your best. 
and you will achieve inshallah the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till we meet again sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah bihamdihi subhanakallahumma bihamdik